25 years ago, um, me and two other pastors um, went to the nation of Moldova, and uh, they had just come out from under um, the reign of the Soviet Union, and um, and so when we got there, we met with um, a guy who was my former pastor, who was a international mission board uh, missionary uh, there in Moldova. We met with him, and we assisted a local pastor, and um, just saw God do some really, really cool things. Got to go into schools actually and preach, and I mean, it was a just a really awesome time. And uh, so uh, this past Sunday, um, we had a reunion of the of the missionary, um, the indigenous pastor from Moldova, and myself and another one of the pastors. Only one of the pastors could not because of health reasons. And it was just such a blessed time uh, to be able to share. I appreciate um, Harold preaching and um, and and. Uh, just having the opportunity to go and do that. And so we're good to be back with us. If you got your Bible, and I pray that you do, if you'll turn with me to Mark chapter 10 and verse 35 as we continue our way through the book of Mark. And uh, so we're going to finish it before you know it. And we're almost out of chapter 10. But if you would please stand in honor of God's word. As we stand, we're just saying that God's word has authority over my life. And I'm going to listen to it today. I'm going to honor the word of God. And in verse 35, it says, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one on your right hand and one on your left, in your glory. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? And they said to him, We're able. And Jesus said to them, The cup then I drink, uh, the cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism with which I'm baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those who whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Father, my prayer is this. May the word of God be spoken boldly here today, and may you accompany it with your signs and wonders. Change us, O Lord. Please come and meet with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Yesterday, I decided that I would bake some cookies. Okay, all right. Now, I, I do that. Uh, you know, I, I like to bake. I like to cook, and um, and so um, we get this every week. We get a box from Everplate, and it's a it's a meal plan. You know, we we pick out what meals we want. I kind of like that. It comes. It comes straight to my, my house, even during COVID, when everybody was having trouble finding groceries. You know, for some reason, they were able to con continue their uh, supply chain, and uh, we were getting at least three or four meals in, and it brings the recipes. Well, last week, the box had a cookie recipe in it. And so, uh, you know, I decided that I would bake some cookies. Okay, all right. There's two pictures in this next slide. Now, I don't want you to focus on the second picture yet, okay? All right, just the first. This is what they were supposed to look like. Okay? This is what they look like. And it came out like that, and I'm like, candy. I mean, they have messed up they have messed up the recipe you know they usually they're so good and she asked me she said did the recipe at any point say put the cookies in the fridge before you put them in the oven 
I said, well, let me go back and look. Guess what? That's exactly what it said. Put the cookies in the fridge for 10 minutes, and, you know, then bake them. Well, I didn't do that. You know, and, and I'll be honest with you, it was sort of like the title of the message today, you know, that Britney Spears song of 2000, Oops, I Did It Again. Okay, all right? I mean, because, you know, I just, I'm, I'm a mess up. Guys, I, 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 you know, I, I don't always get it right. I, I just absolutely don't get it right. You know, that song, Britney Spears, she taunts that she's playing with the heart of a guy uh, that she's kind of keeping in the friend zone, okay? All right, look, I'm trying to talk to the young crowd today, all right? Keeping them in the friend zone. And, and she said, oops, I did it again. I played with your heart, got lost in the game, you know? And as I read this story here in the book of Mark, uh, you almost see that. Oops, the disciples have done it again. You know, and we kind of brought this out a couple weeks ago when we were preaching the previous passage. That, you know, that, that Jesus, you know, he tells them about, you know, that he is going to Jerusalem to, um, uh, to be betrayed. He talked about his beating, his death, and even his resurrection. And, and immediately... After he shares that with them, we have this story that we read today, the story of James and John, where they're, you know, are requesting positions of honor with one sitting on his right hand and the other is left in his glory. And, and as we pointed out last the time when we preached this, that it seems that every time that Jesus speaks about his death and resurrection, almost immediately the disciples remind us of why Jesus had to come. You know, I mean, it's very evident that these men that Jesus chose were sinful men. And by the way, guys, this is one of the ways that we know that the Bible is truly the Word of God. Because if this was a made-up story then we would clean these stories up a little bit, okay, all right? I mean, we wouldn't have Noah getting drunk and, and getting naked before his kids. You know, we, we wouldn't have David having that adulterous relationship. You know, we would clean the stories up. We would make the heroes look really, really good. But the truth of the matter is, is that it is a true story. And it's a story about sinners, but also a great God who saves and redeems sinners. You see, what this story story does today is this the story shows us why the cross is necessary because you see it's very evident in the lives of these disciples and as you look in the life of the disciples even though they were the chosen ones even though they were following Jesus even though they were in his school of discipleship even though they had seen his power and compassion displayed they keep having these oops I did it again moments you know, where they show their true selves, they show their heart, they show that they are messed up men in need of the grace and salvation of God. And, and so what we learn is that there is no hope for these men apart from the power of the transforming grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. They need the cross. They need themselves what Jesus himself is saying that he's come to do. They need it for themselves and not just them. We need it. We need the cross every day. Guys, your life argues every day the necessity of the, the, the cross of Jesus Christ and that salvation that comes from that cross. And, and not only do we need the cross, but the cross is forever our example of the life that Jesus is calling us to live as his believers. That those who have been redeemed 
my friend, are to follow his example. That is what this scripture is about. And so let's just kind of dig into this. And the very first thing that we see is the audacious desire of the disciples. Okay, all right? And, and the audacious desire. Picking it up in verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they came up to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand, one at your left, in your glory. And Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? And they said to him, we're able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. So James and John come up to Jesus and say, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. Now, now, what do we know about James and John? Now, we know that John wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. And if you've been in D groups, you've been going through John. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. In my group, D group, we actually, discipleship group, we just started the book of Revelation. By the way, if any of you men want to be in a discipleship group and learn how to study the Word of God and, and have that accountability, I've got some spots. It's open. We do a Zoom call on Thursdays and uh, where we kind of come together and talk about what we've been working with throughout the Scriptures. The ladies have one that meets right before the church. So we have a group for the ladies and a group for the men. But you know, the book of John, the Gospel of John, and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, I mean, you read that and, and it's all about love and God is love and, and how we are to have this biblical, biblical love. But I, can I just tell you that the John who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, guys, has uh, been sanctified a little bit. Okay? All right? He, he's not, he's the same guy, but you can tell he's grown in the Lord. And, and, and because the James and John that we read about in the book of Mark, Jesus called them the sons of thunder. We know that they were hot-tempered. I mean, they were ready to call down wrath upon a city because, you know, uh, guys, they, they, were, they, they, they were sons of thunder. They were the sons of Zebedee, a fishing family. They were probably from a very affluent family when Jesus called them uh, from the business of fishing to be fishers of men. And, and so they probably had a fairly good upbringing. And, and so in Matthew's account, if you read Matthew's account in Matthew 20, it's not actually uh, James and John, but it's their mother Salome that comes up to Jesus and asks this, you know, and, but, but Mark kind of cuts to the chase, right? Mark lets us know who was behind mama, you know, wanting them to be on this position, one on the right, one on the left, in all of his glory when Jesus is resurrected. You know, we, we, we know who's really behind it because Mark tells us that it was, it was them. And in verse 35, you know, in verse 35, you know, they, they say, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. You know, and so whatever we ask. Now, isn't that interesting how they said that? Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And in other words, it's almost like they're demanding Jesus. Jesus, we need you to do us a solid, okay, all right? And, and then Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And they said, Lord, we want you to grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Now, can I ask you something? If Jesus were to say to you this morning, what do you want me to do for you? What would your answer be? What would be the first thing on your list? I mean, it, it could be, Lord, save my kids. God, I just, Jesus, could you save my children? 
Or, or it could be something like, Lord, would you help me with my spouse? Because he just cannot shut the cabinets, you know? And he's always dropping his laundry on the floor. You know, I don't know who has those issues at all. And, uh, you know, I mean, you might ask Jesus to help your spouse out a little bit. You know, or, or Jesus, could you give me a better supervisor? I really could use that, you know? But listen, they don't ask for stuff like that. They ask, what, what they ask for is very audacious. It's very arrogant. Their request is they want the best seats in the house in the kingdom of God. And, and look, they, they don't really have a clue what they need because, see, what they actually need and they desperately need, what they're proving by just asking the question that they need is the very redemption that Jesus has come to offer them. You see, their question shows us there's a problem in these two. And, and, and listen, before we point the fingers at James and John, it's a, it's a problem that we all have. Yeah. You see, they, they have no sense in their request uh, of their spiritual need, just how desperate a condition they are in apart from Jesus Christ. And, and, and it's so it's, it's the fact that they're sinners that they would even ask that. Lord, grant us to sit, one at your right hand, one at your left, in, in your glory. Now, can I just tell you that? That has nothing to do with furthering the kingdom of God. Matter of fact, they're not wanting these positions to further the kingdom of God. Let's be honest. They want prominence. They want position. They want power. They want that special place next to Jesus. Guys, it's that meism that sin produces in all of us. What do you want? What, what would be your one thing? Jesus tells them, guys, you don't know what you're asking. You know, you are, are you able, they, Jesus asks, you know, to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized, which is to respond. You know what the men say? Yeah, we are able. Yeah, Jesus, we can drink of that, that cup, you know. Uh, well, guys, it just goes further. It's pride. It's self-confidence. See, here's, here's what all this means again. So important for us to remember this. Sin is going to push you to be the center of your world. Guys, guys, and, and that's the one place where we must never be. But sin is going to push you to be the center of your world. Sin is the biggest problem that you as husbands and wives have in your marriage. Sin is the biggest problem that we have in our parenting. Sin is the biggest issue. Because sin, and, and, and Harold always talks about the me monster. Well, I found a picture of the me monster. There he is. You know? Beware of the me monster. Okay? Sin will always make it about you. Sin loads us with self-interest. Sin loads us with pride and jealousy over other people. You know, about I deserve, you don't deserve, I deserve that. Sin, all those things. You know what they show? They just show that you and I need God's grace very, very, very much. You know why? It's because this meism is a problem of the heart. And, and, you know, as hard as I could try to deliver myself from me, I can't do it. I need God's grace. I need a power greater than me to handle me. Okay? You know, candy can't handle me. You know, I mean, I guess only God can. These are all conditions of the heart. And it, it, it's these things in my heart that makes me a lawbreaker. That, guys, that make, I, I want to write my own rules. I want to be the sovereign over my own life. You know, and because of those conditions of the heart, man, I just can't escape sin. I, I'm, I'm not able to live in a way that's pleasing to God. I got issues with me, and so does all of us. The Bible says we all have come short. You know, we all 
have, have fallen into sin and, and we come short of the mark. And so, so that's exactly what we see here. These guys are being very, very selfish, self-centered. And you know what that leads to? That leads to some very angry disciples, doesn't it? You know, I mean, I mean, and when the 10 heard it, the other 10, they began to be indignant with James and John. And I get that. I get it. And you know, Usually at the center of every division, whether it be church, whether it be marriage, whether it be friendship, guys, at the center of every division is always sin and selfishness. Amen. It's just always there. James, y'all, hey, here, here men, James, y'all going to be talking about this? Come, come Tuesday. James 4, 1 and 2, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? I bet you Harold is going to say me monster at least five times in that Bible study on Tuesday, okay? All right, guys, guys, it's, it's, it's inside of you. You desire, you don't have, so you murder. You covet, cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And, and so you, you just got this battle inside of you. And, and so if we're at a place where we can't have unity, Guys, it's probably because of sin. And they are indignant. But you want to know what they're probably angry about? You know what the other ten more than likely are angry about? It's because James and John asked Jesus before they could. You see, if the truth be known, and I'm not, I don't want to read into the scripture at all, but guys, but we've, we've seen them kind of rise up at different times. If the truth be known, James and John probably asked Jesus, and they're like, man, I wanted that spot. And they're angry at the thought that they may get an advantage that they didn't get. Because, you know, Jesus hung out with them and Peter a little bit more than he did the rest of them. And so, see, that's what sin does to us. Guys, that, that just shows you the condition of our hearts, all of our hearts. Which leads to our third point. is the agonizing destiny. Because Jesus said to them, do you not know what you're asking? And he asked him, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? And they said to him, we're able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but is for those for whom it has been prepared. Jesus is very, very patient with these guys, isn't he? Very gracious. I mean, he's, he's very instructive, and I mean, he doesn't go, you knuckleheads, you know, and, and I can't, you know, y'all are so selfish, and he doesn't kick James and John out of the 12. You know, he shows incredible grace to them, but he says, guys, you don't know what you're asking. And then he asks him a question. He says, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Be baptism with the baptism which I'm baptized. And they're like, yeah, we can do that. And in some ways they will. But guys, there are ways in the cup and in the baptism. There are ways that Jesus, he's going to go and do some things that they could never do because they're mere men. Jesus is the only one who could bear our sins on the cross. And Jesus is saying, guys, you have no idea what you're talking about. They want the best seats in the kingdom of God, but the best seats always come at a price. You see, there's a cup that Jesus says that he's going to drink. And he asked them, Are you gonna, can you drink of the cup? And, and when Jesus says that, he's actually quoting the Old Testament as he always is in the course of his ministry because he's fulfilling those Old Testament passages. But he's always quoting the Old Testament. And, and now he's alluding to passages in Isaiah and in Jeremiah that speak of the cup of the Lord. But when, 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 when the Isaiah and Jeremiah speak of the cup of the Lord, it's the cup of God's wrath. 
condemnation against sin and defilement. It's the same cup that Jesus would speak about in the Garden of Gethsemane where when he prayed, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me if there's any other way. Because Jesus knew even then what Calvary would entail. It was the cup of God's indignation against sin, his hatred of sin, his wrath against sin. And Jesus Christ would go to the cross and drink that cup for you and me. He would drink it to its bitter end. He would take our place. He would become a substitute for us, a sin bearer. And as he would take our sin and our defilement and our guilt upon himself, and, and what God would respond like a righteous God would respond with his holy wrath poured out upon his son. Jesus would be separated from his father, the son, the eternal son of God. You know, who had fellowship with his father for eternity on that cross would drink, drink the cup of wrath for you and me. Did you, did you ever notice? I did not notice this though I was studying this today. He did not cry on the cross, My Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me? He cried out what? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because the righteous God was judging Jesus at that moment for the sins of those who would believe on Christ Amen. so that my sin would be placed on him so that there would be no condemnation yeah. for me because I've placed my faith in Christ. Yeah. Now can, can I ask you something? Could you ever take that cup? No. Can you take that cup, which is, hey, listen, the only way that you drink the wrath of God for your own sin is for you to die without Christ and go to hell. And you will drink it and you will face it. You know, and, and listen, you guys, but you, you could never do that for other people. Because you're a sinner yourself. And, and yet Jesus, listen to this, not only did he take my sin, which is much, but he took the sin of you and you and you and hundreds and thousands, if not millions, all their guilt, all their sin. Jesus bore it on himself and, and so that you and I could stand before a holy God one day righteous and clean and redeemed. And so he asked him, can y'all drink my cup? And then he asked them if they're able to be baptized, by, baptized with the baptism that he's be, that he's be, that he will be, is baptized with. And he's not talking about the baptism of John the Baptist there, okay, that he's gone through. But what Jesus is talking about is, is that he would be submerged by men's hatred and mockery and torment and killing and death. That he was going to go down and down into all of that. That he's talking about being flooded in the fury of God's wrath, covered with the Father's judgment, that he would descend, descend into the bottomless pit of God's unrestrained wrath towards our sin, that he literally would become sin for me, my sin. And, and Jesus would deep, dip deep into that. You know, and, and, and every breath in that darkness which Jesus breathed was contaminated with my sin. Every sight he had was the evil of my sin. It was consigned to him there on Calvary's cross to the point that God would place his wrath upon him and abandon Jesus at the cross for you and me. And that's Jesus' dipping. That's his baptism. And you know what he says? He says in the scripture, the joy that was set before him. 
That's how, for you, he did that. And by his cross, he, he came to sit on his throne. And listen, neither James nor John nor anyone else could have sat on their thrones without his cup and, and without his baptism. We, we can never, ever have a relationship with this God without Jesus. How fearful it would be to endure all the weight of the blame of your own sin forever and ever. Listen, I don't know why any of you would ever want to enter eternity without Christ. Why would you want to endure the weight of his wrath for your sin? Why, why would you ever want when there's Christ? Do you really want to drink of that cup? Do you really want that baptism? And, and listen, James and John, yeah, 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 we want that. And then Jesus tells them in 39 and 40, and, and they said to him, we're able. Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those whom I has been prepared. Now, Jesus kind of takes a corner with them. He says, guys, you don't understand Rather than being princes and dukes in my kingdom, rather than having pre preeminence and rulership, you know, he says, look, you're, you're going to drink of that cup and you're going to, you know, partake in that baptism because Jesus is telling them, I'm calling you to suffer. And Jesus will say later, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. They're going to be despised. Matter of fact, James is not even going to make it out of the book of Acts. James is going to, about the 12th chapter of the book of Acts, Roman soldiers will come to him. And if he died according to tradition, three of them would come to them. One would hold up one arm, other would hold up another arm, and he would be, he would be taken through with a sword. And die right then and there. Only, it's only in the twelfth chapter of Acts, and James is dead. James, John also would have his measure of sufferings. He'll be whipped by the Sanhedrin and the Acts of the Apostles. He'll be banished to the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation. You know, I mean, because that that guys, well, that's that's discipleship. Following Jesus will cost you. Yeah, amen. Guys, it'll cost you something. You, all of us, if you follow Jesus, you're going to drink that cup. You're going to be baptized with the baptism that he was baptized with. It's a very sobering passage because to follow Jesus, guys, is not to fit into this world. No. Guys, it's not to belong here. There, guys, you're, you're going to be hated. You're going to be ostracized. At times, you might even be lonely walking your path, guys. That is what a disciple of Jesus. That's why we need the church, guys. That's why we need together and love each other. And 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 because it's it's we we need each other desperately bad, guys. See, the question is this: Do you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Do you really want to follow Him? Do you want to follow him? Are you willing to go down like Jesus went down? Are you willing to serve like he served? Are you willing to go through stuff on, for, for his sake? Which leads us to the last point, which is the admirable duty. In verse 42, and Jesus called them to him, you know, all of his disciples. He, he called them over because the others are upset over what James and John it says. And he says this, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Amen. And Jesus just lays it out. You guys, if you're going to be my disciples, if you're going to be following me, you need to understand who you're following. You need to understand 
what the kingdom of God is all about. And so do you and me. We need to get this. Amen. The kingdom that Jesus has called us to doesn't operate like the world. Where it's about prominence, where it's about power and, and possessions and pleasure. Matter of fact, he says to follow Jesus is to become a servant. A diakonos, verse 43. And then, hey, he gave the example in verse, you know, and he gave, he said, Jesus came to become a slave, a doulos of all. That, that our example of what we're to be and, and who we are to be as, as Christians, as believers, is that we are to be servants and slaves of Jesus Christ. Think about it. A slave. There's nothing in the life of a slave that a slave determines for himself. Everything about the life of a slave is determined by his master. Every aspect is determined by the will of another. Every picture of his life, guys, is dependent on his master. He lives for his master. All his energies are for his master. His boundaries of his life are set by his master. Guys, there's a way in which the whole life of a slave is expended, you know, for the sake of someone else. And here's what Jesus is saying. He's telling his disciples, he's telling James and John, you want it to be about you, but the kingdom of God will never be about you. It's about me. Living for me. It's about my plan of taking the gospel to the world and making disciples. It's about living every day for the glory of Jesus Christ, the one who saved us and redeemed us. It's about his grace. It's about his kingdom. And listen to me. God, Jesus is calling his disciples to lay down our wills to him, to lay down our way, our plan, our dreams, and find joy and bringing glory to Jesus Christ that the world may know how wonderful of a Savior that he is. Man, do you, do you find joy in that? Man, I hope you do. Does God have, listen, Jesus is laying claim to every aspect of your life. You guys, your wallet does not belong to you. Your calendar does not belong to you. Your time does not belong to you. You are a slave to Jesus. And he's a great master, though. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You get to sit at his table. Guys, he's a wonderful master. Guys, he lays claim to my mentality, and he has, lays claim to my emotions. All my gifts belong to him. All my relationships, all my possessions, all of my private and public moments, they're his. All of my joys, all of my sorrows, everything that makes up the life of Johnny Beaver, John, Jesus Christ lays claim to. Amen. The rule of his kingdom is this. And Jesus taught us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, and for that to happen, my will must die. Johnny must die. And that's what his grace is doing. That grace comes in you and he releases you from the bondage of sin and the slavery to your own will. Guys, you're no longer you're under the bondage of sin, but you have the ability to obey him. You have the ability to please him. Guys, God doesn't save you and me so that we can do as we please. He saves us so that we can finally do as he pleases with our life. And so that you would find joy in the thing for which you were created. You were created for his glory. You were created to further his kingdom. That's the kingdom, he tells his disciples. And James and John, I'm sorry, boys, you got it wrong. John Piper says that Mark 10, 45 
is what turns Christianity into gospel. I mean, because see that word for in verse 45, for? Why, why should you become a servant? Why should you become a slave? Why, why should you do all these things? For even the Son of Man came. Not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Because this is why Jesus, that's why we do it. For, because Jesus has done it for me. It's that simple. And oh, what a servant and a slave that he was. For even, emphasize the remarkable humility that, that Jesus shows in doing this. For even the Son of Man, that title that Daniel gave him in Daniel 7.13. You know, and, and it, it, the, the, the Son of Man is what? Ransomed. That language of Isaiah 53.12. That the Son of Man, the one who comes with the clouds, is ransomed. That King of all kings is ransomed. Ransomed. That he, he's Messiah, but he's a suffering Messiah. He's a servant Messiah. The man for all men, the man from heaven, the Son of Man. What did he do? He did not come to be served. He came to serve. And if he serves, then it's my mission to serve. And if he gives, it's my mission to give. And if he stoops, I stoop. He gave his life as a ransom. That word ransom means to deliver by purchase. Whether it's a prisoner of war, or a slave, or someone condemned, it means a payment required to release. And Jesus Christ gave his life as a ransom, not to the devil, but to the Father. Because the Father is righteous and holy, and something has to be done for our sins. It's the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement that Jesus' death on the cross would pay the price to purchase the release of the bondage of all of those who would give their lives to Jesus. Nanny Aiken said this, he says, Righteousness demanded it, but love provided it. What love! In the words of that old hymn, Hallelujah, what a Savior, you know, guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was He. Fulfillment, full, He, full atonement can, be, can it be. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Man, hallelujah. What, what a Savior. What a, what a Savior. Man, can I atone for somebody else's sin? Nope. I can't. But I can sure share with them Jesus who can. Can I save anybody? Nope. But I can point them to Jesus. I can serve them. I can love them like he loved me. Not because they deserve it, not because they're cleaned up, but because they're dirty like me, man, because I've been treated that way. I, I, I go and I serve like, like my Savior did, and I give my time, and, and I give my, my energy, and, and I give myself. I can serve the lowliest of the low. I can serve the despised and the rejected. I can make my life not about me so that at the end of days, guys, when I leave here, that I leave a hole in this world, not because I did a lot of stuff for people, but I, but I served Jesus and I made him big. Guys, that's, that's what it's about. I pray you do that. I pray I do that. Amen. James and John got one thing right. In verse 37. When they said, and they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. They got the in your glory right. Because one day 
We're going to stand before Jesus Christ in his glory. Guys, we're going to stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ. And I promise you at that moment, everything that you did for Christ will be worth it. Man, it'll be so worth it. And the scripture tells us that they cast their crowns at his feet. Anything they did, any reward that they, they cast it at the feet of Jesus. Because when you see Jesus in all of his glory one day, it'll be worth it. Man. So, Jesus asked them, what do you want me to do for you? What, what's your answer? Because see, whatever your answer is to that, it speaks to your spirituality. Lord, I really, you know, I mean, if, what is, because I tell you, he's interceding on our behalf. He's our advocate right before the Father. And, and man, you know, we, we're able to go and bring our petitions to the Father because of Jesus. And, 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 we all fight the me monster. Selfishness is the very DNA of sin. You cannot become selfless on your own, though. You are desperate. You are in desperate need. See, I got faults right there. Your E is desperate, desperate need. You're in desperate need of his rescue this morning. Man, would you just pray for grace? I, I bet you some of y'all, some of us have been selfish this morning already. You know, we've lived for ourselves, and man, we, we've got to, we've got to die to that. Amen. Man, you need grace. You need His help, you know. Selfishness leads to division. Division in family, in marriage, in church, and other spheres of life. Here's the question. Where do you need to ask forgiveness and reconcile because you have been selfish? Just sit, sit on that a moment, you know. Hey, do you need to go home and apologize to your spouse because you've really been selfish? You're, you're upset with them because you are being very, very self-centered. And maybe you need to go say you're sorry. Every division in a church is because somebody's being selfish. Somebody is thinking about themselves and, and not what Jesus wants. Okay, all right? Guys, where do you need to go and see reconciliation today because you are selfish? And then last of all, Jesus is calling you to follow him. He came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Where are you giving your life away? Where are you serving? Where are you serving? You know, if you looked at the hours of your week, how many of those hours belong to him? And how many are belonging to you? How much of your money belongs to you? How much of it belongs to him? Guys, I, I mean, all of this, guys, he's calling you to give it away. Give away your time. Where are you serving? Where are you laying down your life? Man, I was talking to, uh, you know, a couple right before church that's opening a, a women's home here in Lafayette. You know, and, and honestly, we need to be asking them, how can we serve you? Man, hey, how can we serve? They're helping ladies that are coming out of incarceration. And y'all know I did that. I was a reentry person. These people come out of prison and jail, and they barely have anything whatsoever. You know, and we want to throw them out there and say, okay, all right, here we go. Make it. You know, and, and they're, they're serving a women population, a woman population, which is, there's, hey, there's all kinds of men. Hey, there's a lot, a lot of men, halfway houses and programs out there for men, you know, and they're serving a population that's very vulnerable, you know, and, and needy. And, and, and honestly, we should be coming up to them and say, hey, how can we serve you? Hey, they're right here in our community. And, and man, we need to be coming alongside of them and doing whatever, whatever they need. If they need their lawn cut, hey, hey, call me. I don't have, by the way, I don't have a lawnmower. Don't ask me to do that. You know, I mean, I mean, but I know people that do, you know. And, and, and guys, whatever they need, we need to, to serve because I just think 
When you start serving people that absolutely can't bring nothing back to you, that's the way Jesus is because he saved you when you were lost and undone and had absolutely nothing. Nothing. And he loved you anyway. That's the kind of love that we need to give for people. I told my men this week, as I, I tell you, it's frustrating working at a prison. Man, it is. Not being able to have service, not being able to do. But you know what? I'm not there for the paycheck. And I'm not there. I'm there because the Lord was very, very clear to me. That's where you need to go. That's where you need to serve. That's where I am. Y'all pray for me because sometimes I don't want to be there. Sometimes I want to quit. Okay? Where are you giving your life away? Man, are you following Jesus? Are you? Are you following Jesus today? Lord, God, help us. Help us, God, to follow Jesus Christ. Lay our lives down to give God to sacrifice. Lord, I'm sorry, God, that I'm selfish with my time, my money, my talents. Father, I don't give enough. Lord, help me and show me how I might serve you by serving others, God. God, help me to become a waiter. Help me become a slave. Father God, help me to glorify you. Make much of Jesus with my life. Please, God, help me. And, and, and Lord, I pray this for all of us. And God, I pray, Lord, for the one who may be sitting here today who's never given their life to you, who's never trusted in Jesus. Lord, I pray that they would ask themselves right now, do I really want to face God's wrath without Jesus? And I pray you would disturb them. God, I pray, Lord, God, that it would eat away at them until they give their lives completely to Jesus Christ. And Lord, may they do that right now, right where they're at, by, by, by turning around, that they recognize this is not the life I want here on this earth. Turn around and repent and come to Christ and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and he is Savior. And I pray that they, right where they sit, they would cry out, Lord, save me. God, please save me, O God, a sinner undone. And God, if they've done that, Lord, and they never have followed through in baptism and identified with Jesus, I pray, Lord, that they would do that quickly because of what Christ has done for them. Amen. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for being here today. Um, bow your heads, please. Father, we bow before you in the lovely name of Jesus. And Lord, we've heard today the message of your Son. He said, I, we're not to be rulers in this kingdom. We're to be slaves, servants in this kingdom. I came to be a servant, and I'm sending you to be servants. Lord, you tell us in your word that we are to present ourselves, our bodies, as living sacrifices, wholly acceptable unto God. And that is our reasonable, our rational Worship. That's how we worship you. Dear ones, as we are bowed before the Lord right now, in your heart, will you present to him yourself? Will you present to him all that you have? Is there anything you're holding back? It's not laid upon the altar to Jesus Christ, it's not surrendered to him. 
your time, your talents, your treasure, all that you have, your children. We can't keep them. We have to give them back to you, Lord. We can't uh, make them go in the way we want them to go. Only you can do that. And so, Lord, please, I just pray right now that everyone here would surrender and would lay upon the altar everything they've got. And they would say with the old servant of Christ, take my life, Lord, and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my silver and my gold. Not one might would I withhold. Nothing, Lord. Nothing, Lord. We hold back nothing. You held back nothing. We hold back nothing. We give ourselves completely, totally, absolutely to you. A servant, a slave has no rights. So we're just going to bring all of our rights that we think we have, and we're laying them on the altar right now. Right now. Right now, Lord, we would do that. And I ask you, Lord, that everyone would do that here. I pray that no person here, under the sound of my voice, would spend eternity in hell, bearing the wrath of God for all eternity, when your Son has borne the wrath of God for all who will believe. I pray that we would surrender in absolute faith today, right now. In Jesus' lovely name, amen. God bless. Uh, Johnny will be back there. Candy, would you go back and join him? I'll be up here if you want to talk about your soul, please.